All right, your big moment. The solo's coming up. Yep, lead pedal on. We're in the key of E major, so we're gonna do E major pentatonic. You got this, let's go. Oh, you melodic beast. That's right, take them on a sonic journey. Give them a little Jimi Hendrix. Let's build the intensity, come on. You're better than this. There you go. Build the intensity, big bend. Wait, what's going on? Why doesn't this sound good? Keep bending. Emergency minor pentatonic. There we go, play faster. Chops. Yeah, good save. Yep, nailed it. <laughs> What's up, everyone? My name is Matthew Dale, and I am here to help you play better, sound great, and understand more. And that's kind of a goofy intro to discuss the topic of today, which is going to be the key isn't everything. Sometimes when we are soloing and improvising, playing our music, just knowing the key is not enough. And I use this, uh, this song, if you recognize the tune, it's Melissa by the Allman Brothers. Great song. I use this as an example because this actually happened um, in real life. I was playing a solo gig and someone, um, actually the person that hired me in wanted to sit in, so it's kind of hard to say no in that situation. So uh, he sat in, uh, him and a buddy, and they played kind of a small little duo, half hour duo set, and then I got back to um, my regularly scheduled programming after that. Um, but they played this tune and um, one guy was on acoustic guitar and sang and uh, the other uh, the other guy um, played lead fills and lead lines around this song and I could tell that he was really focused on the key of the song in this sense E major. Now, I think it's probably fair to say that we've all kind of been there, including myself. I used to be that type of player because I've always been interested in improvising. I used to be that kind of player. Well, I don't really know the song that you're talking about, but just let me know the key and I'll play some fills. You know, that's a very um, musically immature place to be, but it is some place that we might often find ourselves. And that's, you know, there's no shame in that. It's just a part of our musical journey. Understanding how to get out of that or how to grow from that is really the uh, most important part. So what really seems to be the issue? I mean, songs are written in keys and keys um, have scales associated with them. And then using that scale uh, will guarantee a great sounding solo, right? So if we're in the key of E and we play licks around the E major scale, we should get a really nice solo, right? Well, not always. Sometimes when songwriters write songs, they don't just use chords that are associated with that key. We would call those diatonic chords. Our diatonic E major chords would be E, F sharp minor, G sharp minor, A major, B major, C sharp minor, and then technically speaking, D diminished, D sharp diminished, or for playing a seven chords, minor seven flat five, and then back to E major. Those are our diatonic chords in E major. But let me go through the chord progression that happens in Melissa. We've got E major, and then kind of like this F sharp minor over E, G sharp minor over E. Could also be seen as an E major seven. I'm not gonna get into semantics though. We go back, we kind of do that again. And then we have A, B minor, Actually, if we're really kind of focusing on the real harmony that's in the song, B minor, which is different, C sharp minor, D major, E major, F sharp minor, G sharp minor, A, C, and then B. So we have a couple of chords that are borrowed from other keys, and we call those borrowed chords. So if our chords are out of the key, it doesn't really make much sense to 
still be playing within that key. Now, the biggest offender, if you remember from my little goofy intro video, the biggest offender here is, and I kind of planned this out, but I'm in E major pentatonic. And I'm bending this B up to a C sharp. But I do that over the C chord, which sounds pretty awful. <laughs> That's not great. But it is something that could occur in E major pentatonic if we're playing E major pentatonic over that C chord. We also have another big offending chord, which, or we have another big offending note, which would be G sharp in this case. So even though G sharp sounds great in E, that C sharp, or that G sharp, I should say, does not sound particularly good. If we look at E major pentatonic through the lens of what is what are all these notes on top of C, we get the third, which is nice. I'm going to actually play a C in the bottom of this. C is nice. F sharp's actually not bad. G sharp, a little bit strange, depending on the context. B, not bad, actually, if I play it just by itself. And then we have C sharp. That's really offensive. And then back to E. So how do we actually deal with that in the key? Um, first is really pay, paying attention to the chords that you are soloing on top of. I've, I've talked about this before on my channel because I think it is such a big topic. And it's not a topic we talk about all that often. Um, search how to guitar solo on... Um, on YouTube and be, you know, bombarded by, well, the key of the song is A, and you can play A minor, pentatonic, and so on and so forth. Um, not very often do we see someone that gives you, you know, I guess I'll say real and actual answers. Look at the chords. Now, this is a more advanced way of doing this, and generalizing a chord progression is generally okay. And by generalizing, I mean um, looking at the overall key of the song, picking a overall scale to use as your soloing ingredients, and bam, go. Generalizing is okay in certain contexts. In this context, we need to be more specific to the chords we're playing. So, I mentioned this is a borrowed chord. Where is this chord borrowed from? Well, it could be borrowed from several other places. And it's really up to us in our own musical interpretation to decide the route that we're going to go. That's one of the great parts of being an improviser, is having control and conviction um, for playing the notes that you choose. So let's just start by taking a look at C as just an isolated chord here, C. So if I just see this, if I just see a chart with one measure of music and it's a measure of C and it says solo over the C, I'd probably assume that I'm in the key of C. So I could treat that C for that measure of music as the key of C. Now what other keys do I find a C major chord in? So it's in the key of C, it's also in the key of G as the four chord. So G, one, two, three, four. So I could also think of this as temporarily the key of G. As the four chord. And that has kind of a nice sound to it. We'll come back around, we'll circ circle back around to that in a second. I could also treat it as the five chord in the key of F. And then it would be more appropriately a C7 in that sense. Now, if we compare this to our key of E, which one makes the most sense? So what if I just take an E major scale, full seven note E major scale, and just adjust all the notes that don't work with my C major chord. So we have E that worked, F sharp that was actually okay. Um, instead of G sharp, I'm gonna play G natural because that's A, that's the fifth of our C chord. And then A, and then B, still good. And then instead of C sharp, we're gonna play C. And then we would have D sharp in there, but that sounds kind of odd. So maybe I'll move that D sharp down to D. Well, now I have 
the key of E minor or also G major. So see how kind of we got there. We got back to our G major. C is the four chord of our G major, our key of G major. Now, what is also special about the four chord? And this is going to be my first um, go-to tip for you for playing over unique chords. C and the fourth chord of our major scales uh, is our Lydian chord. That's the, the Lydian mode. So if I play a G major scale, starting and ending with C... That's the sound of C Lydian. And whenever we have a non-diatonic major chord, we can just assume Lydian. That's tip number one. Now, if you're not much of a modal player, don't worry. Tip number two is even better. So another quick thing to do is just match your major and minor chords to major and minor pentatonic. So if you have a non-diatonic major chord, just assume you can play C, in this case, C major pentatonic. And then I'm going back to E major pentatonic from there. That also works 100% of the time. Now, also in that same pen pentatonic vein, if I'm going from um, the key of E major to the temporary key of E minor, I can also use E minor pentatonic for a little bit more of a bluesy connotation. Um, that's also the key of G major pentatonic. So now we're kind of going back to that, hey, we could treat it as the key of G. And the last tip I would give you for this type of thing is when in doubt, chord tones. Play arpeggios, find chord tones, because those will always sound really good on top of those unique chords. So let me give you kind of a real world example of this here. I'm going to go through all three, I guess maybe four of those methods. I'm going to start with playing C Lydian or using the G major scale or the E minor scale from this. Uh, I'll also use a little bit of E minor pentatonic as well. So I'll do this one over two of these unique C chords. And then I'm going to go with our second tip, which is going to be match the chord with its corresponding pentatonic. So C major chord, C major pentatonic. And then on the third one, I'm going to play chord tones. I'm also going to pay special attention that I am resolving out of this unique chord back into our key, E major, more specifically chord tones of our B chord that we're going to. I'm gonna start kind of right in the middle to dive into it, and here is our track. C Lydian. So there was one. Now I just climbed up that scale. All the way up to B, because B is a common note shared between those two keys, E minor and E major. And then it worked. It resolved itself. Now I'm going to do the same thing. And let's do E minor pentatonic just for some extra pizzazz. Resolving that minor pentatonic down to an F sharp note, which is the fifth of the B. So it gives it this nice resolution. Now, what next? Let's do a C major pentatonic. kind of jumped the gun. I anticipated the C major pentatonic, so you kind of really saw that it was coming up. And 
And then I landed on B, the root note of our B chord. Next, let's do the third method, which is arpeggio notes or chord tones, highlighting the chord tones of our unique chord. Again, getting back into our, C, our B chord in some unique way. So let's see how that sounds. <laughs> So on that time, I just played this C triad arpeggio and I added just a couple of uh, in between non chord tones uh, and I borrowed actually from the C major scale of this. I played an F, so like a C sus four thing. And then I also got all the way down to resolving to this low B note. I think I played something like that. Um, I don't remember, but that's kind of cool. Now, I could also probably try something where I highlight the third. Kind of like that. Let's actually see what that sounds like. I'm going to go straight to the C. Yeah, that kind of works too. So I'm just trying to find either a B, D sharp, or an F sharp to get me back into that... Uh, that B chord and back into our key. So don't make the mistake that I made in this intro and that I've also just made in my playing in the past when I didn't know any better. You're still gonna want to understand what the key is and then also understand what your diatonic chords are in those keys. A really great resource for that is actually my Essential Music Theory Cheat Sheet, which you can get for free. Just go to my website, matthewdale.com theory, and you can download that helpful guide for yourself or you can follow the link in the description box below. But don't just stop with your keys and your diatonic chords. Understand a little bit more about borrowed chords. I hope this was helpful. Once again, my name is Matthew Dale. I am here to help you play better, sound great, and understand more. Drop me a comment below if you found this interesting or helpful in any way. I will see you in the next video. Have a great day.